Good. Let's take our seats. I don't want to stand with you. You don't have to say anything about it. You can, you can edit those comments. So let's start with uh, the first afternoon session. We have, uh, fortunately, John Leahy, who will uh, sort of keep us awake, I'm sure. And he will be talking about attention, social learning, and choice. And then Bartosz from the ECB will uh, discuss. John, the floor is yours. Hello? OK. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting me in the afternoon session. I see it's now 8 a.m. in New York, and uh, so now I'm awake. Um, and, uh, and I will try to keep you awake. You all have food in your bellies and your blood's being drained from your heads, and it's usually a good time to do a little economic theory. Um, okay. So this paper is joint with uh, Andrew Kaplan and Philippe Mateka. Okay, so this paper is based on two premises. The first is that people have limited attention and time. And the second is that people make choices about which they have things that they have very little expertise. And people are not born knowing how to value firms into the infinite future. They're not born knowing what retirement is like. They're not born understanding the vagaries of the US healthcare system. They're not born knowing that you could maybe, if you ask, get a mortgage that at some future date you could switch to an arm if there was a financial crisis. Um, these are all things that we, you know, have to learn and teach ourselves. And th that's where the first point comes into, uh, into question, is that people have limited time and attention. We're all busy. We don't often have time to fly to Europe for a couple of days and talk to August groups of, uh, of economists and other gathered um, luminaries. Um, but, you know, so we do what we can, right? Okay. And so in this situation, it's natural, first, that people are going to use all the information that they can get. They're going to use their own expertise, what they can learn on their own. They're going to Google things. Um, but they're also going to pay a lot of attention to what's going on around them. What are other people doing? What are people doing who they respect and, uh, and they know? And uh, so there's going to be a lot of social learning, learning by, by observing. And then second, the people are going to make a lot of mistakes, that they're not going to get it right. Unlike standard economic models, where you have a menu, and because of revealed preference, whatever you chose was clearly the best possible thing, when you have limited attention, sometimes you choose the worst option. Okay? In the examples I was giving before, there's a paper by Hall and, uh, and Woodward, which argues that people are very bad at choosing mortgages, that they leave thousands of dollars on the table. Um, papers by Fed guys that people don't even know what their mortgage is. Um, there are, uh, people make a lot of mistakes. Okay? Now this leads to two views of market share, or you know, popularity of items, popularity of choices, popularity of the 30-year mortgage, for example. One is that large market share reflects preferences, that you see something as popular because a lot of people like it. And this is the basis of inference in, in almost all I.O. models, trade models. Trade, effectively, and I.O. equate market share with preference, either low marginal cost, low price, or high high return. The other view of market share is that uh, it may reflect beliefs which are mistaken, hurting, fads, fashion, people doing things because other people are doing them. And uh, this is the basis for most of the social learning literature, that uh, people don't always, um, always uh, do think the best thing in their interest. And the question is, you know, does this matter? that the, both of these things are going on, that people are, 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 are making mistakes, that they're following other people, in which dimensions does it matter, and so forth. And that's the topic of the paper. OK. So what we're going to do is construct a model, because we're model builders. And uh, in this model, it's going to have several features. Um, first, that people are going to have limited attention. They're going to make mistakes. We want people to kind of not always maximize from the menus that they look at. Second, that they're going to learn in part 
by looking at what other people do so that there's some potential for herding, there's potential for, uh, for, uh, for fads and fashions. And then third, that choices are gonna be a mixture of being popular because they're awesome and popular because they're popular. So popularity is gonna feed back into choice, reinforce popularity. Things have to be, in some sense, reflect individual tastes because if people are just doing things because they're popular, then popularity would have no information and no one would have any reason to do what is popular, right? So you have to have some link between choice and utility or payoff, but popularity will exacerbate this link and make it uh, much, much, much stronger. Okay. So some previews of the results. Um, first one, focus on the welfare results. It turns out in our model that herding among chosen options is not, there's no externality. Even though there's learning from others, people know the world and since they know the world, they know other people are hurting, and they kind of correctly invert signals. So among the stuff that's actually seen, people choose optimally. And, and that comes out quite, quite robustly. If what they, I'll show you the proof later, but uh, that's quite, quite robust. The inefficiency, which is similar to other models of hurting, is mostly on the extensive margin. Things that are unpopular tend not to be chosen at all, but they could be quite good for some people. And so what you get is a suboptimal menu, but people order, they, they make mistakes um, because they have limited attention, but given their limited cognitive capacity, given their limited um, knowledge, they do the best they can and no outsider could make them do better without, well, the standard recipe is to provide them with more information. And it's not obvious that people who are overloaded cognitively, that's actually a good thing. But it's not obvious an outsider subject to the same constraints would be able to do any better. So the herding is going to affect mainly the menu and not optimality within the choices. And that's what I'm going to show you. Second. Those with idiosyncratic tastes are very ill-served because of the herding tends to shift things towards the more, op uh, more, the more um, frequent choices. If you happen to be um, you know, the one person who likes uh, polka music, oh, actually that might be liked around here. Um, anyway, if you're the one person in the US who likes polka music, it might not be very many places to find it. Um, but uh, um, they tend to do poorly because they're hurting and pitching the optimal things, they're almost always making mistakes, people who are, do, who are, who are idiosyncratic. And then second, the pattern of mistakes turns out to be very revealing. If you, it's going to be the property of almost any optimal learning mechanism that you shift choice in the direction of what you like. I mean, it would be kind of insane if you went out there and tried to learn and it like gave you all the stuff you don't like. I mean, any optimal learning mechanism is gonna make you more likely to choose good things. You might still be hurting, you might often choose bad things, but you're more likely to choose good things. So if I compare what Frank is choosing to what I'm choosing, the relative frequencies would be very informative. Frank almost always might go you know, for German food. I always go for German food too. But he just, every once in a while, he goes for Mexican. He should always be eating Mexican in our model because the, relative, the relevant, uh, the, the, the relative frequencies are gonna be very informative because what he's learning on his own will shift him to what he really likes and away from the herding. So if you have a lot of data on choice by type, a company like Amazon, or Google, companies that know pretty much everything about everyone can do a lot better job choosing for you than uh, you can choose yourself. And that's not inconsistent with my earlier statement that choice was optimal because I was putting the government on the same footing as the individual, and I'm not gonna put Google on the same footing as the individual. Google sees a lot more stuff than you see and has algorithms for calculating a lot more things than you see. You buy a mortgage once, Google can look over all mortgages at all times and in all places since you know, 
500 BC to the present and calculate, you know, basically to very small error, you know, frequency of choice. Um, that's not anything that I do. I'm, I know nothing about mortgages in the Roman times, and I have limited attention, and so I won't know anything about mortgages in the Roman times, right? But Google, they have an incentive to, uh, they already have the data, they just have to put it together. Okay. So the fat pattern of choice and mistakes is going to be revealing. Optimal learning raises the chance that you choose what you like, and that Basically, it's relative choice am among groups that determines what groups like, assuming groups all, you, we've grouped people together in the right ways. Okay. Last bit, an advertisement for rational and attention a la Sims, and that is it makes things very tractable. You can do much more complicated learning situations. Um, the social learning literature, the learning literature in general, has basically lived in two paradigms. One is the Bernoulli world with two choices and two signals, and you can invert that, and you always get another, you always get a probability of being right. So you can make it recursive, you can do dynamics and things like that. The other is the normal, normal world with normal quadratic utility, normal signals, normal noise, normal um, shocks, and that world also replicates itself. But if you want to move outside of that world, it, things get very messy, especially to write models down and solve models. Um, rational and attention gives you very nice equations that you can play with. They're not always nice in the sense of, of solving them. Well, actually, solving them numerically is trivial, but analytically manipulating them. But you get the answer very quickly, which is kind of nice. So I want to make a, a, a plug for that. Okay. Here's the model, very simple model. So if you know there's this old model by Bic Chandani, Hirschleifer, and Welsh about herds, fads, fashions. Um, they have a Bernoulli world. Things can be good or bad. People take sequential choice. We're going to adjust that from multiple choices, multiple types of signals, and play off that. So time's going to be discrete. It's a bunch of periods, 0, 1, on. There's no end. There's going to be a fixed set of options. You're going to be learning, so we can't have the world changing too much. If we had the world changing, I mean, we could get similar results, but it's just going to be much messier. We're going for the simplest possible model, so the world's static, and therefore you can learn from what people have done in the past. There's a fixed set of options. Call them I in some set A. There's N, A of them. Each period, there's a continuum of agents that are born. They make once-off choices from A, and then they die. Life is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, you don't live very long in this economy. And we killed dynamics there, so there's no experimentation. Learning is all going to be once-off, right? If this was the, I gave the example of food with Frank, he probably knows a lot about his food taste because he eats every day. This is much more like choosing a mortgage, choosing a life insurance, things that you don't do very often, so you don't accumulate the experience, and so you really are pretty clueless about your match with the product. There's going to be a finite number of types. Call them omega. They live in some space. There's n omega of them. And then there's a utility function, which says that the utility of type omega from choice some choice in A is some number R, and that's the payoffs. That's what you're trying to maximize. Now, there's a time invariant. There's going to be three mu's. So there's time invariant distribution of types, mu star. That's like how many people there are of omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. That doesn't change. If that changed, you wouldn't be able to learn from the past. Very, I mean, you would have to take into consideration that what you're learning from the past isn't exactly what you're trying to learn today. Just keep it fixed, keeps things simple. So we're going to be able to, because mu doesn't change, past choices are going to be informative about current tastes. Agents don't know their type. You might think it's more natural to say agents don't know what goods they like. It's the same thing. I don't know if I'm the guy who likes, you know, German food or Italian food. Uh, I'm the, I could be the guy who likes Italian food, or, you know, I could put it, the type being what kind of food I like. It's basically the same thing. Mathematically, this works out simpler, so we're doing this. So I don't know which kind of guy I am. Am I the one who likes this, this thing or this thing? And now there's going to be two sources of learning. Like I said, to learn from others, others have to know something. So, oh, sorry, so first one is observation of past choices. We see what everyone else did in the past. 
Think of that as a stand-in from you tend to learn from what you see done. I mean, we're giving people a lot of information, again, to keep things simple. And then other people wouldn't be very interesting unless their choices reflected something about the world. So everyone does a little information learning on their own. I'm going to model that like Sims, OK? And that's going to be the rational and attention. And then the last bit, I have to tell you what learning means. So I'm going to place, so much of the learning literature builds models in which there are signals, and then you pick a signal, and then there's a posterior, and then we try to solve the Bayes rule thing of taking our prior and producing a posterior. That puts a lot of constraints on the types of models you can look at, because you need models that are tractable, where the posteriors are tractable functions of the prior. Um, we're going to follow SIMS, and we put the costs on the outcome. So to have a certain posterior or a certain outcome is costly. To have an outcome that, where you know the world is much more costly than to have an outcome in which you don't know the world. So we're not going to model the signals per se, but the outcome of learning, the more you learn, the more costly it is. That's the way it's going to work. Um, and so what we're going to do is we have this function P, which is the probability of making choice i if you're type omega. And I'm going to then basically what's going to be costly is the outcome, which is look at the big equation on this equation. It's big because it's blown up, but it's also long. Um, so the probability, so what's going to happen is I'm going to take, take this function, this concave, log is concave, and so it's going to be, it's going to, and it's all less than 1, so it all gets flipped. So spreading out, making pi of omega variable is going to be more and more costly. And in fact, because I'm subtracting off pi ln pi at the end, if I made this completely state, con in state uncontingent, I mean I always pick pi with a certain probability, independent of the state, the cost would be zero. So there's no cost to just ignoring the state and randomly drawing an act. But what's costly is making the choice of i contingent on omega. And the more and more contingent, the more and more costly. So I go out and learn. What I'm supposed to learn is something about my type. By learning something about my type, I then make the choice contingent on my type. And that's costly. How I learn is unmodeled. And that's the big, in some sense, analytic advantage of Sim's approach. The outcome is what we're going to model, and, uh, and that's how that's going to work. So I'm going to focus on the, the paper we do a bunch with convergence. We put it in appendix because I think Olivier was the one that told me a good paper should always have an unintelligible appendix. Or maybe it was all the unintelligible stuff should be in the appendix. I, I can't remember exactly the way he said it, you know. I wasn't paying attention. Um, but uh, we have an unintelligible appendix in which we do convergence, but I'll focus on the steady states here. Um, we're going to begin with a problem of an agent who has observed the past market shares. They're going to lead some prior mu, and then I'm going to solve for what they do given this prior. That will then lead to the next generation having some beliefs, and then I'm going to look for a fixed point in which the prior of today's generation is the same as the prior of next generation, and that's going to be my solution for now. It's in some sense a self-confirming equilibrium. There's no relationship that mu, this mu, has to look like mu star. It could be something totally different. There's just no more learning. For example, you can't learn about things you don't see. So if no one chooses an option, you can't learn the preference for that. So you would never converge to mu star in that case. So in general, mu will be different than mu star. But the process of learning will have settled down. And there'll be no more incentives to learn. And so the world will be just stuck there. OK. Here's the agent's problem. This, looks, this is actually not. It's pretty straightforward. So, and this, so I have v, which depends on mu. It's my value function. I'm going to choose all these pi omegas. I'm going to choose how state contingent to make my choices be. And in that doing that, I burn information. The next thing is just uh, rational, it's just um, um, expected utility. 
So I have a prior mu. If I do mu, there's a probability I choose i. If I choose i when I'm mu, I get ui mu. That's just expected utility. So I'm maximizing expected utility, subject to this cost, which is the state contingency of information. And land does a parameter that scales like how hard it is to learn. Land is big, very hard to learn. Land is small. Um, even undergraduates can do it. I apologize if there are any undergraduates in the audience. OK. Now I'm going to do the literature review. In some sense, this paper relies on two other papers in the past, one of which is uh, Mateka McKay, which solved this problem for discrete choice when a whole group of objects. So what Mateka and McKay do is they show that pi omega has this form um, where if you already know the, P, if you know the PIs, this is what the PI omegas are. They don't show how to solve for the PIs, but they solve for the, actually, sorry, I take that back. They don't show when PI, when, so let me do some notation. PI without the omega is the unconditional choice. PI with omega is the conditional choice. They do not characterize when PI is positive or zero, but conditional on it being positive, this is the optimal choice. And it has this uh, logit kind of uh, McFadden feel to it, that you basically twist your choice in the direction of things that are good. If U is good, you do it more often. If lambda is high, learning's difficult. So you don't, that mitigates the, the, the payoffs. So lambda and U t t characterize the twisting in the direction of good choices. Um, so you care more if, they, if the U's are very different. You don't care if the U's are the same. You care if, you, and so forth. Then this other, the other background paper is this paper but with, that I wrote with uh, Mark Dean and uh, Andrew Kaplan. And this paper is all about the PIs when they're positive and when they're zero. And it's this complementary slackness condition. And the reason this paper isn't better known is this has no intuition. I can't tell you a story for where this comes from. This is the complementary slackness condition. And I can tell you stories, um, but they would take us too long, and you just had lunch, and, uh, and I don't want to put you to sleep. So take this as given. So this is the solution to the agent's problem. Now in steady state, I said we had this appendix. The way learning works in this world is you think something, you do something, and then the next generation says, you know, did they do the thing they thought they were going to do? Because the actions, the true actions depend on the true distribution of types. The learning depends on your beliefs about the distribution of types. Whenever those are inconsistent, people will rule out certain distributions. You keep ruling things out until you converge. I think that's all we need on this slide. And here's the first welfare result. I said that, that the choice among chosen options was always optimal, and this is basically the proof. So what's the first thing? That's the probability that I is chosen given some beliefs. The next thing is the probability that I is chosen, which depends on mu star, not mu bar. Mu bar is the beliefs that people have. Mu star is the true distribution. Given the true distribution, pi omega mu bar, that's the choice that people are making. So the probability something's chosen depends on what strategy people are following and the number of people following that strategy. So those two things have to be equal. Then you plug in the pi omega mu bar, the optimal strategy, that's from Mateka Makai. And then you can subtract, you notice the pi mu bar at the beginning and the pi mu bar at the top. I can cancel that, and then I get our necessary and sufficient conditions. Well, those necessary and sufficient conditions have mu star in them. So even though people don't know mu star, their choices are satisfying the necessary and sufficient conditions for somebody who does know u star. So it's as if they know the truth. We can just assume they know the truth because they're behaving exactly the same way as somebody would behave if they knew the truth. And so they're behaving optimally. The two so one comment and one caveat. The comment is the way this works is that if people's behavior was inconsistent with the truth, 
people, the next generation would notice that and they would say, wait, we got something wrong, they'd learn something and then you would converge. So it's only when the behavior you see is consistent with the truth that learning stops. The caveat is that, uh, is that uh, this requires the set of choices to be, this is optimality given a set of choices that are made. I didn't say anything about the set of choices that were made. And that's where all the externalities, hurting, and stuff has bite, is that there's lots of choices that might... Imagine a world in which everybody loves uh, maple bacon ice cream. But no one ever serves maple bacon ice cream. So no one ever sees anybody eating ma maple ba bacon ice cream. Then no one would learn that maple bacon ice cream is the best thing. And if the government then mandated that every restaurant for a week serve maple bacon ice cream, there'd be a huge welfare improvement, right? There actually have had maple bacon ice cream. It is not as good as it sounds. <laughs> maple ice cream is great. Maple bacon is great. But there's a non-transitivity that works when you combine two great things. They don't exactly go together in the same way. It was, a, it was I mean, you've got to try things. Um, anyway, this actually fell in the face of my favorite stra learning strategy, just ch choice strategy under uncertainty, which is that there's something on the menu that sounds horrible. It had to earn its place on the menu, and therefore you should choose it. So I always choose the most unappealing thing on the menu. And that usually worked except for maple bacon ice cream. It, 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 it failed there. OK. A um, couple of other comments in the few minutes I have left. First comment is that uh, unlike the McFadden model, here choice depends upon market share and utility. So there's this extra term. I actually should have done something. I should have taken this PI and made it L E to the LN PI and then put the PI up in the, in, the, in the exponent. And then you can see that there's a taste shifter, which is if other people are, eat, are doing it, it makes it as if it's more valuable. Last comment is this bit about relative utility. So if we take this payoff, this function here, and what I'm going to do is suppose there's two goods, i and j, and then I'm going to solve for ui minus uj. And I get this equation, which says that the difference in utility between two goods is resulted. This looks like Velasa's comparative advantage equation if you're a trade guy. So if you if people who get more utility from i than j tend to people, be people who are more likely to choose i than j relative to the population, which just makes sense. I had an example. I don't have time for that. Let me do the conclusion. Let me say things that we didn't do, which would be cool. And that is, if you have all these confused consumers, you really want to model the supply side. I think that uh, Peter is going to talk a lot about evil suppliers who might supply things that people don't need. Um, and that side we haven't done at all. So in evaluating the optimality of choice from menus, another reason to think of worry about the menu is the menu is not exogenous. It comes from somewhere. So that's important. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot of work ahead. Um, and I think uh, Bertosh is going to bring some of that out. Thank okay. you. Thank you, John. Bertosh. Okay, I'm uh, happy to be here to discuss this very good paper. Um, it's going to be very difficult for me to speak after John, but I find it comforting that it would be difficult for any of you to speak following John. So, uh, And also, um, the paper has a positive part and a normative part, has some positive results and some, some normative results. My discussion will mostly focus on the positive results whereas John's presentation emphasized the normative results, but we did not coordinate. Um, okay, so I want to start with an introductory slide about what rational inattention is. So um, the starting idea is that 
a vast amount of available information is in principle relevant for many economic decisions. So this is a paper about discrete choice. So to take an example, suppose you decided to buy a car and now you, you, you have to make a decision about which car uh, you're gonna buy. This is a discrete choice decision and there's a lot of information out there that's relevant for that decision in principle. You could study the technical, uh, technical specifications of different uh, autos um, or you can read information on the internet or you can just look around and see what cars other people are driving. Um, and um, the uh, initial observation of rational inattention is that decision makers cannot pay attention to all this available information. What they can do is they can choose how to allocate their attention, essentially which, um, which pieces of information to, um, to pay attention to. Um, and uh, the literature on rational inattention following Chris Sims is just a formalization of this idea in which limited attention is modeled as a constraint on information flow where information flow is, uh, is um, entropy reduction and entropy is a measure of uncertainty. And what, uh, what's going on formally is that agents choose the joint distribution of their action and the state of the economy. That's the P of I and omega in John's notation, the joint distribution of my action I and the state of the economy omega, subject to the constraint that says my action can only provide a finite amount of information about the state of the economy. There's a constraint on how much information my action can reveal about the state of the economy. An equivalent way to think about this is that these agents are choosing noisy signals about the state of the economy, subject to the constraint that the signals can only provide a finite amount of information about the state of the economy. And so the resulting behavior is going to be both error prone and disciplined. It's error prone in the sense that um, if you decide to allocate more attention to some variable than I do, then my behavior, my response to that variable will appear as erroneous from your point of view. I'll be, you'll be seeing me make mistakes. But of course, uh, my, dis my, my decision, my behavior is optimal from my point of view. I've maximized uh, utility, uh, my, maximized an objective, um, subject to a constraint, um, um, and so uh, from my point of view, I'm not, uh, I'm not doing any worse than I could have. Um, so, uh, so, this is, th so the fact that this is a disciplined deviation, uh, so, so the fact that the behavior is disciplined means that this is a particular deviation from the benchmark of perfect information and rational expectations, but it's a disciplined deviation. Okay, and the paper is about discrete choice under rational inattention. So uh, think of each of a continuum of agents as taking one of action I, uh, and there are N possible uh, choices you can make, N different types of cars you could buy. Um, the agent's payoff depends on a random variable omega. So the payoff function is U of I and omega. And as John explained, you can think of omega as your type, or you can think about it as, um, as the, um, um, the characteristics of the car. And agents start with a common prior about omega. Before taking the action, each agent can learn about omega. They can update their prior subject to an information flow constraint. And what this information flow constraint uh, means is that after updating the prior, the, there will be some residual uncertainty about omega. Right? So the decision, the choice of what car to purchase will be, um, will be made under incomplete knowledge about, the, about omega. It, omega will still be a random variable. Well, in this setting, um, a, a, an existing paper, a paper by Philip Mateka and Alasdair McKay in AER, um, it derived an important result, and that is that the agent's behavior uh, will be uh, stochastic in, in this environment and will, be follow, and will follow a particular logic model. And this is, um, uh, and so the probability of choosing a particular action I conditional on a state of the economy omega will be given by this modified logic formula where lambda is the marginal cost of information and P of I is the unconditional probability of choosing action I. 
Okay? So this is a very important result it's because it's uh, very general. Okay? You, uh, there's no restriction on you on the, on the payoff function, and there's also no restriction on, on, um, on the probability distribution of omega. So this is a, a, a powerful result. Now, a drawback from an applied perspective is that, in general, there's no closed solution for the PIs, for the ex ante probabilities. And furthermore, the PIs depend on prior beliefs, which, are, which is an unobservable. Okay? So, now, here comes this paper. And the authors suppose that agents can observe past market shares. Okay? Then... They prove, given that assumption, they prove an important result, which is that agents' belief will converge to a steady state after a finite number of periods. And in that steady state, um, the, the unconditional probability of the action, the P of I, can be identified from the market shares, which are observable. Okay? In particular, the ex ante probability of taking action I, P of I, is just going to be equal to the steady state market share of, of option I. And so I get to update my formula for the conditional probability of choosing action I given state omega, and, um, and I get to plug in my observable market shares into the formula. So um, this result is important. I think it makes the rational inattention model of discrete choice suitable for empirical work. And the paper discusses the relationship to the random utility model, but also discuss, discusses applications to inference of skill distribution and inference of individual preferences. Okay, and in addition, the paper discusses welfare results, which, um, which John uh, focused on. Uh, but my discussion here emphasizes this uh, positive result, which makes the, the model suitable for applied work. Now, I really like the paper. Uh, I'm going to make two comments. Uh, the first one is much more important than the second one. The first comment is, what if the market is not in steady state? So I'm, I was thinking of an applied person who would like to use this paper to actually do um, an econometric study of discrete choice and interpret the results uh, from the viewpoint of rational inattention. Well, the paper's formula for um, the action probabilities holds in steady state. And the author's discussion of how to achieve unbiased inference assumes that the formula applies, that is, that the market is in steady state. Um, but what if the market is out of steady state? What bias on it, of, uh, in inference and how much of a bias will there be? And furthermore, do we know how fast convergence to the steady state is? Now, having raised these two points, let me uh, also s say something in defense of the authors. It's possible that convergence is very fast. It's also possible that consumers simply use heuristics that postulate that uh, my prior probability is just going to be equal to the market share. Okay. Um, furthermore, uh, I think that point is probably clear, but I want to make sure it is, the model does not imply that market shares in the data must be constant. So for example, if preferences change, so will the steady state market shares. Um, but I think for, for this, so to conclude this, uh, with this comment, it, it's, um, it would be nice uh, to know a little bit more about um, out of steady state behavior before uh, applying this to um, empirical work, though I realize this is a this is a very hard problem. This is a very hard question to answer. Okay, the second comment um, w is about an assumption worth making to progress empirically. And I was, f for a moment, I was thinking about putting a question mark at the end of this, but I actually agree with the authors uh, that this assumption is worth making to progress empirically. And nevertheless, it's it's good to um, to keep in mind that the authors are making um, an assumption which is important. It gives them tractability, uh, but at some point it might be a good idea to try to relax it. So what is this assumption? So in general, under rational inattention, agents' perception of any information is noisy. Okay? The idea is all information that's relevant is in principle available, and any of it I'll perceive with noise, and I just decide what pieces of information to observe with how much noise. 
Now, in this paper, consumers digest one piece of information, that's the market shares, perfectly, with zero noise. So market share data are observable for free, while the information flow constraint applies to all other information. So there is an asymmetry, and this asymmetry is a simplification for the sake of tractability, and I completely agree that uh, it's an assumption worth making. And by the way, this assumption has been made in the empirical literature on rational inattention before, and my favorite paper there is probably by, um, by uh, Marcin Kaspercik, Steve van Muvenberg, and Laura Weltkamp, uh, Laura being our next presenter, where they, uh, they look at a model, they actually test econometrically a model of portfolio uh, decision-making, portfolio allocation under rational inattention, and they assume in that paper that agents see uh, asset prices perfectly, which, uh, um, which is a reasonable assumption. Um, and, but, and, and so in this paper, the authors assume that consumers can easily learn market shares, essentially, which is also a reasonable assumption. Nevertheless, a richer model um, could ask, well, um, you know, is this really the most easily learnable information? Okay, so, um, um, so is it really true that overall market shares are the most easily learnable information? And I was thinking, particularly uh, in the context of social learning, uh, market shares in one's peer group might be, right? It's not uh, literally the aggregate market shares that I'm best aware of, but it's, the, it's, it's what people in my neighborhood or my friends uh, are doing. And exploring this in the future at some point might uh, lead to interesting conclusions, also with respect to welfare. Uh, so um, I like the paper. and. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bartosz. So, floor is open.